Ready, Renata. Thank you, Marty. Good evening, everybody. It's Wednesday, March 9th, 2022. It's 6.30 p.m. and this is a regular meeting of the Moraga Town Council. This meeting will be conducted pursuant to the provisions of the Government Code Section 54953, as amended by AB 361, which authorizes teleconference meetings under the Brown Act during certain proclaimed states of emergency. This meeting will be held via teleconference only and will not be physically open to the public. Town council members and staff are teleconferenced into the meeting by audio under video, and the meeting will be conducted via Zoom webinar. Members of the public may observe the meeting by watching or listening to the meeting through live stream or Zoom. Live verbal public comments may, may be made by members of the public joining the meeting via Zoom. Zoom access information is provided on the website. Use the raise hand feature during the public comment period for the agenda item you wish to address. All right, and since we are on Zoom, let's do a roll call, Council Member Macker. Yes, here. Council Member Onoda. Here. Council Member McClure. Here. Vice Mayor Woolicky. Here. And Mayor Sauce is here. Next is the Pledge of Allegiance. Cynthia, would you be kind enough to lead us in the pledge? Absolutely. I pledge allegiance, allegiance. to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Cynthia. All right, next item is special announcements. There are none. Next is proclamations and presentations, and we have a few of those tonight. Um, so what we're going to do on the proclamations is we'll do the proclamation, we'll, we'll take public comment, and then give council members the opportunity to comment at the end. Um, so the first, and, and we will go around the horn to read the proclamation as we have traditionally done so that all council members can participate. Um, so first is a proclamation honoring Brian South for 20 years of service to the town of Moraga. We're fortunate to have Brian with us and I believe he is in the meeting. Great, Brian, is there anyone else that we need to let in for this? Uh, no. Thank okay, you. wonderful. So um, we'll read the proclamation. And if we could go in order, Sona, Teresa, Mike, Steve, then me, and then do laps that way. All right. Sona, do you mind kicking us off with the first whereas clause? Yes, I'm sorry. You, but you've not done this before. I'm sorry. So we I have each, not. Uh, my apologies. It's my bad. Um, we each do a whereas clause and we go in order until we're done. So you'll go first, you'll do the first whereas clause, you'll end at the at the and, and then Teresa will pick up and then Mike and then Steve and then me, and then we'll be back to you. Okay. Does that make sense? It does. I'm just running into some technical issues. Okay, right. you want to see the proclamation? No. <laughs> okay. Uh, it, it, you, Madam Mayor, if, if I could give a little intro and give Council Member Macker a chance to bring it up. Yeah, um, if Marty can send it to me directly, that everything on the website is down, then that's how I access. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, so why don't we, um, John? If if it's okay, why don't we'll just we'll just start until so to give us the high sign when you're in. And sure. Just, are we okay if we start without you? Sure, I'll try to figure this out. Okay, no worries. Okay, thank you. Teresa, please start us off. Thank you, Madam Mayor. This is a proclamation honoring Brian South for 20 years of service to the town of Moraga. Whereas Brian South was born in Lawrence, Kansas in October 1980 and later moved to Moraga with his family, attending Moraga schools and graduated from Campolendo High School in 1999 and whereas although Brian excelled at teaching tennis and a variety of other jobs he knew at an early age that he wanted a career in law enforcement and began as a police cadet with the Moraga Police Department in May 1997 and whereas Brian left MPD in 1999 to go to college after establishing a reputation 
for his hard work, volunteerism, and for wanting to work with and help the Moraga community and Whereas Brian returned to MPD in 2000 as a cadet and attended the Basic Law Enforcement Academy at Las Medanas College for 19 weeks at his own expense to pursue his career dreams and... Whereas Brian successfully began his career as a police officer when he was hired as a reserve police officer on August 28, 2001 and worked as a volunteer to protect our community and as a probation counselor at Juvenile Hall until he was hired as a full-time officer on August 2nd, 2002, and... Whereas, and an officer, Brian distinguished himself as a field training officer, training many new officers and promoted to sergeant on July 5th, 2009, serving in a number of capacities, including as the department's detective, training manager, field training coordinator, and as president of the Moraga Police Officer Association for a number of years. And? Whereas Brian was promoted to lieutenant on October 2nd, 2016, serving as second in command to, of the department, representing MPD throughout the town and in the county with distinction, managing investigations and patrol functions and coordinating with outside agencies to help ensure the safety of our community and... Whereas Brian also served our community by coordinating support and contributions for the Special Olympics for many years, being a member of the Moraga Rotary Club, including as president for the past two years, and raising money to support the Community Violence Solutions, which directly benefits juvenile crime victims and battered women throughout the county and... Zona? Yep, I'm good. Whereas for the past 20 years, Brian has become the heart and soul of the Moraga Police Department as he has welcomed and mentored many new officers, been involved in every major case and incident addressed by the department in the past 10 years, and been a valued member of the Moraga community, always knowing, living, and supporting the ideal of giving back to the community and... Now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Renata Sauce, mayor of the town of Moraga, along with my fellow council members, do hereby honor Brian South for his 20 years of service to the Moraga community, his incredible dedication to the Moraga Police Department and ensuring that a sense of well-being and security was created and maintained for everyone in our community. Brian, congratulations. Um, Chief, would you like to say a few words before I, I turn? Yeah. I, I would. Um, first of all, uh, as you know, Brian is continuing his, his service to our community and communities throughout the state in his new position with the Commission on Peace Officer Standards and Training. And that's why he's, he's not uh, local tonight. He's, he's actually in Southern California on assignment uh, mm -hmm. in a new job. But, um, you know, when I say he's the heart, he was the heart and soul of our department, he kind of still is. We're, I think we talk pretty much every day and, and, and everything. But you know, his, his sense of service to our community, and actually when you think about his time as a cadet, stretches nearly 25 years, and uh, it, it, I can't thank him enough. Uh, the number of people in our community who, who were touched by Brian, and I'm not talking about by Brian's handcuffs, but, um, but, but his work with victims and, and helping people who, who basically had run into trouble or, or had, had been crime victims or or just needed our help. It, the the list is just too extensive to even even you know think about naming. And he just had such a, an incredible impact. Miss the guy. Love to have him back anytime. I try I try and entice him on a daily basis to to come back home. But uh, but I words can't even come close to thanking thanking him enough. So I, I so appreciate uh, uh, the proclamation uh, in his honor. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, all right, is there any public comment on this proclamation? All right, um, why don't we do council member comments and then Brian give you an opportunity to, to speak if you'd like. Um, council members. Steve. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm, I'm happy to report that all of my interactions with Brian have been positive. I, I never touched those 
those handcuffs. <laughs> and, um, you know, today I, I, I searched the La Mirinda Weekly uh, records, and uh, there are lots of stories that include uh, Brian or, or talk about Brian or focus on Brian. And, and they're all really positive stories, um, community related. And, and to me, Brian epitomizes that community uh, peace officer, uh, perfect for a town like Moraga. And I, you know, without question, uh, I think uh, if that can be that, that his talent can be uh, applied broader across the straight uh, state, at least as much as possible, uh, what, a, what a fine impact that uh, he, he will represent. And, and what a fine representative he will be for Moraga. Thank you so much, Brian. Thank you, Steve. Other comments, Mike. Uh, yes, thank you. First of all, Brian, um, thank you for your 20 plus years of service on the Moraga uh, Police Department. Um, not only do you have the expertise as a police officer, a sergeant and a police lieutenant, to me what will stand out is the way that you fit the character and culture of our community in so many ways. And that's to me, the most important characteristic of almost any staff person, especially our police. Um, he is integrated into our community and especially in our schools and has a positive impact. And I have heard so many positive comments about Brian. Additionally, uh, recently uh, Chief King had credited Brian with taking the lead in obtaining a new grant to find um, a new police officer to focus on vaping and tobacco uh, and other issues at our school. So that's just tremendous as we try to find nickels around here. And then finally, Brian had this small little side project called a, a Rotarian. Uh, he was president two times. And if you know how that happens, everybody takes a step back and Brian was new and he didn't know. So he got to be president twice. So um, a savvy Rotarians know to take two steps back. Uh, but seriously, he was a true leader um, as a president and as a member. And, and Brian, you are a Rotarian in every way of the word. So I'm so proud of that. I must say I'm disappointed for our community to lose all of your valuable input, but um, we're still gonna be um, in touch and we will still benefit in your new role. And I am personally very happy for you that you get to take the next step in your career. Sometimes that just happens. So Brian, congratulations and best wishes. Thank you, Mike. Any other, uh, Sona? I just have, have already said really wonderful things and just echoing my congratulations and thank you to you. Our first introduction, was when you uh, recruited me to participate in the Toys for Tots event. And I'm so glad I did and could see you in action with the Rotary Club. Um, just seeing your passion and advocacy, and even during COVID, you were able to get so many people to participate in that uh, fundraiser. And just was, was really a, a great introduction for me um, to the town and, and to the council. So thank you for that. Thank you, sir. Teresa? Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. You know, Brian, I think of you as a mild mannered person who leads from behind. And I've seen that many times and Moraga is going to miss you, but I know that you're taking part of Moraga with you, especially since you grew up here. And, you know, you're always welcome back, of course. Um, good luck on your future. Thank you, Teresa. And, and Brian, if I can just add, I mean, I, I've, my interactions with you, I've always found you to be kind, ever patient, and so easily approachable, and, and modest and unassuming. I mean, it's all, with you, it's all about serving the public and my, making Moraga and whatever community you're in a safer place. This is obviously a big loss for this town, but this is good for the state of California because the state police will now have someone teaching and instilling in others the values of service above self, empathy, integrity, and dedication to the community. So thank you for your decades of exemplary service to Moraga, and, and I wish you all the best in this next chapter of your law enforcement career. Thank you, Brian. Um, and with that, would you like to say a few words? I would, thank you very much. Well, 
Madam Mayor and Honorable Council Members, thank you so much for the honor of a proclamation. I didn't see that coming and I really, really appreciate not only the proclamation, but the very kind comments um, from all of you. Um, I am very grateful to have had the opportunity to serve um, Moraga and, and especially work with the amazing team uh, that we have at Moraga PD. Um, the men and women, our police officers that are working day in and day out on the street are they're doing the real work, um, and I'm really grateful to have been a part of that uh, family. Um, Moraga will always have a special place in my heart, um, as, as some others have said, that's for sure. Um, but I especially want to thank um, Chief King. Um, he told me I was going to be blushing. He knows I'm not a fan of being center of attention. So this, you know, uh, he, he did a good job with that. But but I do want to thank him very much for his leadership uh, and his friendship. I literally could not have asked for a better partner um, these last seven plus years. Um, he is an integral part. And when he says the heart and soul, um, he, he really is the integral part uh, of the department. And um, I would not would not have asked to be uh, side by side with anybody else. And I appreciate all of his, uh, his support as well. So thank you once again for the honor. Thank you, Brian. So um, Marty will um, work yeah, we, with we, we got that taken care of. Oh, well, you're yep. step ahead of me as usual, John. Thank you. Okay, so you're all set. Brian, thank you so much. Great to thank see you, you and, and, and don't be a stranger. And Definitely not. With us, because uh, with, with the next proclamation. Oh, right, okay, don't go anywhere. I'll stay. Uh, okay, <laughs> great. Uh, next agenda item is proclamation honoring Cliff Docterman. Um, in addition to Brian, is there anyone else that we need to let in? I don't believe so. There's going to be Rotarians watching on the live stream, okay. uh, but not, well, not uh, attendees. Okay, and, they, and they, they, they can have the opportunity to comment uh, during public comment on this. All right, so let's go again in the same order with each council member. Sona, can you kick us off, please? Yes. Again, someone remind me how to pronounce the last name correctly. Dr. Min. Thank you. Whereas Cliff Dr. Min moved to Moraga in 1994 and worked extensively to make not only Moraga, but the world a better place for everyone. And? Teresa, you're on mute. <laughs> I'm so sorry. No worries. <laughs> Whereas in a, life, in a lifetime association with Boy Scouts, he was the youngest Eagle Scout in history and received three of the organization's highest honors, the Distinguished Eagle, Silver Antelope, and Silver Beaver, and... Whereas Cliff's professional life included 40 years in higher education administration, 20 years each at the University of California in Berkeley and at the University of Pacific in Stockton, California. And? Whereas Cliff joined the Rotary Club of Berkeley in 1958, was a member of the Rotary Club of Stockton and joined the Rotary Club of Moraga in 1994. And? Whereas Cliff was one of three men selected by then Rotary International President Clem Renor to design a new program for health hunger and humanity, which led to the first polio eradication effort in the Philippines. And Cliff continued and expanded this effort with a pledge in 1981 to give a gift to all children in the world to be polio free and raise $240 million for that cause. And? Whereas in 1992-93, he became the world president of Rotary International under his theme, Real Happiness is Helping Others and traveled the world to speak to Rotary Clubs, high government officials, and many distinguished groups, and? Whereas Cliff was a wonderful orator and was a highly sought after speaker for organizations all over the world, allowing him to speak to many or to more Rotary Clubs than anyone else in the world, and? Whereas Cliff served as a director of the board of the Rotary Club of Moraga every year, helped with service projects, fundraiser, was a mentor to all club members, and was the visionary behind the all-access playground at the Moraga Commons Park, and? Whereas Cliff was honored as Moraga's Citizen of the Year in 2014, 
for all his contributions to the Moraga community and worldwide and reflecting his accomplishments, his character and the high regard in which he was held and... Whereas the opportunity to listen to Cliff speak was time well spent. His laugh was infectious, his message always uplifting, his joy of life contagious, his humor disarming and his message is always true. Real happiness is helping others. Now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Renata Sauce, mayor of the town of Moraga, along with my fellow council members, do hereby honor Cliff Docterman for his many contributions to the Moraga community and around the world, and for his invaluable leadership and dedication to service over his long and meaningful life. Thank you, everyone. Um, Brian, would you like to say a few words um, on behalf of, of Rotary before we open to public comment? That would be great. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Well, as the president of Rotary, I know I speak, Moraga Rotary, I know I speak for the entire club, um, that we were just so honored uh, to have had Cliff as a member of our club. Um, with You heard how what, what a dignitary he was uh, in, in Rotary International around the world. And he was, uh, Moraga Rotary was his home club. And so we had the real benefit um, of, of his wisdom and we really do miss his presence, but his legacy will always uh, be there and be with us. Um, and as part of that, at our last uh, board meeting, uh, the board voted to make him an eternal uh, member of the board. And so he will always be listed uh, on the board of directors uh, in perpetuity for the Moraga Rotary Club. Um, so thank you for this proclamation uh, honoring him. And um, I know all the club members appreciate it. Thank you, Brian. All right, are there any members of the public who would like to comment? All right, I don't see any hands. Okay, close public comment. Council members. Mike. Yes, thank you. Um, I am Rotarian and Cliff was one of the first people I met um, as a new member. And I would sit to him, sit with him at the lunches, and I'd learn so much. So when we ever we had a new member or a prospect, make sure they sit next to Cliff. That was the key. I was always impressed with his knowledge, his passion, and his insights. Uh, Cliff has been a Rotarian for over sixty years, and has served the less fortunate around the world as one of the leaders to make eradication of port of polio a global goal, which has been nearly uh, realized as we speak. There's only a few cases left out there. And for perspective, po polio vaccines have been administered to 3 billion children. That's billion with a B. 3 billion children in 122 countries. I find that amazing. Locally, it was Cliff who is trying to think of a 50th year anniversary project for our Moraga Rotary Club. And he came up with the idea for the all access playground suitable for all abilities and all people. It took a sea of many people to make this happen. And it was Cliff's vision that began us on this journey. A truly special person, not just Moraga, not just the United States, but around the world. Thank you, Cliff. Any other council members? Um, Steve. Thank you, uh, Mayor. We all seem to be reticent to, to tonight. Um, you know, I, I really value uh, my brief interactions uh, at Rotary Club meetings and at Moraga Royale with uh, Cliff. Um, you know, he and Margaret DePriester were made quite a force at the uh, Moraga Royale while they were both there. Um, and I, you know, in the lunchroom, uh, you know, Cliff, Cliff was just, you know, like he, he held court. Uh, he, and it wasn't that he, he was, he was egotistical about it. I mean, he was just a very gregarious, outgoing guy. And, and, uh, you know, between he and Margie had two of those, uh, you know, the shakers and movers of, of Moraga there. Um, you know, his life was was one that we can all admire, and I, I, our community was blessed to have Cliff as a member. I'm I'm very happy that uh, we 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 can we can say that, and and uh, I I will cherish his memory. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. 
All right. Um, I, if, if I may say a few words, I mean, I, I unfortunately did not know Cliff, but I certainly knew of him and of the imprint that he made on our community and on the world. His efforts towards eradicating polio are legendary, and he leaves behind a powerful legacy of service and deeply caring for the well-being of other people. So this community is fortunate to have had Cliff in our orbit for so many decades and will honor his memory by redoubling our own efforts to helping others. So thank you, Cliff. Thank you, Brian. And um, uh, again, uh, we, we honor Cliff Docterman tonight. Okay. With that, uh, we move to our last uh, proclamation, a proclamation honoring the Moraga Garden Club. And I want to welcome Bob B. Preston, Julie Stagg, Penny Walwark, Janice Liu, and Jessica Fleming, with apologies if I'm supposed to ask someone else to be admitted. Um, please come on in if, if, I, if I miss someone. Marty, are you letting them in? She is. I certainly am. Okay. It's There's taking a... more than one attempt sometimes. Thank you. We see Bob, we see Bob. Oh, wait. I Bobby for a minute. Yeah. We lost people. Huh. Oh, Bobby's here. Oh, okay. That's right. Now I see. There you muted. There we are. All right, let me know, uh, Marty, when everyone's with us that's supposed to be with us. I believe that is it. Okay. Brianna would know for sure. Are we good, Brianna? One, two, three, four. Jessica Fleming would be the fifth, and, and there she is. There she is. That's Welcome, everybody. everyone. Thank okay. you all for coming tonight. This is, this is fantastic. Sure. All right, we will now read a proclamation honoring the Moraga Garden Club. Sona, can you kick us off? Whereas in November 2020, the Moraga Garden Club launched the Moraga for Monarchs initiative led by co-founders Bobby Preston and Julie Stagg that resulted in the installation of a 2,600 square foot monarch habitat and demonstration garden at Rancho Laguna Park and... Whereas the Moraga for Monarchs um, initiative was made possible through significant community support that included over 2,870 volunteer hours and donations exceeding 92,000 and? Whereas the Monarch Habitat includes over 600 plants, including 95 different natives and drought tolerant varieties to increase the habitat for pollinators creating environmental, educational, and artistic benefits at Rancho Laguna Park. And whereas the tireless, tireless commitment of the Moraga Garden Club spanned over a 15-month period during the height of the global pandemic, the Moraga Garden Club adjusted to changing recommendations and guidance continually modifying protocols and procedures to ensure the safety of all and Whereas the past president of the Moraga Garden Club, Penny Woolworth, provided exemplary, exemplary leadership in championing this effort and bringing this project to fruition. And whereas the habitat features beautiful artwork by local artists, including a, magnific a magnificent monarch sculpture over six feet tall that was donated to the town by the Moraga Garden Club, becoming part of the town's permanent collection. And whereas the habitat features a, a solar power fountain, state-of-the-art precise irrigation sightseeing benches in, installed um, around the perimeter of the garden, and extensive plant identification and interpretive signage, and... Whereas the lasting environmental impacts of the project will benefit California's iconic monarch butterfly population and provide nectar to various pollinating species, and... Whereas the habitat will provide public education by enabling the dissemination of public information and enabling community outreach through the availability 
of docent-led tours and educational opportunities for youth and adults and whereas the habitat will serve as a representation of community effort and Moraga's spirit of volunteerism and dedication and whereas the completion of the Monarch Garden has enhanced and beautified Rancho Laguna Park creating a lasting benefit for the Moraga community whereas January or Jan June 5th, I'm sorry, I'm having an off night tonight, um, 2022 will be recognized as Monarch Day is Moraga's as the community celebrates this significant accomplishment with the Welcome to the Garden event scheduled at Rancho Laguna Park. Now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Renata Sauce, mayor of the town of Moraga, along with my fellow council members, do hereby honor the Moraga Garden Club and project co-founders Bobby Preston and Julie Stagg for their vision and dedication to creating the Moraga for Monarchs pollinator habitat and demonstration garden at Rancho Laguna Park. Thank you, congratulations. Um, so what we'll do is we'll take public comment and then council member comments. And then if anybody from the garden club wishes to speak, we, we welcome you to do that. All right, do we have any members of the public who would like to say a word? All right, seeing no hands. Uh, council member comments. Oh, oh, before we do that, Brianna, did you wanna say anything? I'll just say a really quick congratulations. If we could fit more faces on the screen tonight, we would, but these five ladies um, are just wonderful human beings. And you know, when we talk about the volunteer spirit, of Moraga, this project just walks the walk and talks the talk. And on a, on a personal note, I will say just what um, a joyous adventure journey it's been working with these ladies over the, the past two years. Um, you know, this project was a beacon of hope in the middle of COVID, brought some tears, some happy ones, some really late night stressed out ones, but you know, we're, we did it, we're here. This is an amazing project. And and I thank you guys from, from the bottom of my heart, so. Thank you, Brianna. All right, council members, any would like to say a word? Uh, Teresa. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, ladies, and I'm sure lots of gentlemen too, what a terrific effort. And it shows that sculpture is gorgeous. The flowers, the plants are amazing and inspirational to all of us who want to have gardens that are native. So fantastic job, congratulations. And congratulations to all of us in Moraga to have that in our park. Other council members, Steve. Thank you, Mayor. Um, you know, I, I happen to you know, have raised a couple of daughters here in Moraga and, and a lot of their youth were spent annually uh, heading down to Pacific Grove to see the monarchs uh, there. And uh, that was a real treat. And uh, we did experience firsthand the decline in the visitors population of the monarchs over recent years. And, and that was certainly a visible indication of something amiss. Uh, I, I don't know that the whole story is yet out, uh, but uh, you know what a what a what great uh, uh, you know benefits and, and I you know really admiration for Moraga citizens to grab hold of that and not only create a way station for monarchs as they migrate and they what a, what a what a journey these these butterflies take you know multi year and and uh, a super accomplishment. And not only do we have a way station for them now and hopefully helping them out, uh, it's a real asset for the town, uh, a positive improvement. And it, it, it incorporated concrete foundations already at the park. So, you know, uh, no additional concrete uh, other than for the, you know, the, uh, the, the butterfly statue, but uh, reusing that foundation also is a, is a real positive. And so uh, I commend all of you. Uh, it was uh, from being mostly observer, a little bit of volunteer, but mostly observer, 
boy, what a what a hectic uh, uh, schedule you guys uh, put forth and work uh, work effort. Um, con uh, congratulations, thank you. Thank you, Steve. So, I want to really thank you for inspiring us during the height and peak of the global pandemic. I, I moved here during the pandemic. I go for regular walks at the commons at Rancho Laguna and I saw this saw signs about this project and then started seeing the development and it was just really inspiring during a time when there really wasn't a lot to look forward to or or be excited about and you you made it happen and did it in a, in a way that brought so many people together and energized by it so thank you and congratulations Thank you, son. Mike. Yes, um, thank all of you. This is just truly genius. I remember talking to Bobby and I said, how did you come up with this idea? I could never even dream something this brilliant, just to be very honest. And Bobby's telling you, well, Julie and I talked about the declining population and what can we do? And uh -huh, we have we have a project. So this is just fantastic creating this habitat. And then that sculpture that you have, of the butterfly. When I heard there was going to be a sculpture of something, I said, okay, great. And then I saw that. I mean, I've never seen anything like that. That's just beautiful artwork. So to me, I just want to say this is Moraga, a community of volunteers working together, creative ideas, widespread com community support, and at the end of the day, getting it done. I can't think of a better project that represents the character culture and ingenuity of our community in Moraga. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Mike. Um, I, you know, that the, the butterfly habitat is truly a triumph of, of passion, of commitment, of ingenuity, and of dogged persistence. And it's a terrific example of an effort that drew from and drew together all parts of our community. And it's, it's a, it was a strong and collaborative partnership between town service organizations on the one hand and the town government on the other. And it's a, it's a thing of beauty. I mean, it, it's not only attractive to the monarch butterflies, but it's colorful, it's whimsical, and it a, is a work of nature's art. Um, the butterfly statue is just a cherry on top of the sundae and I'm pretty sure that soon it will be a regular stop for visitors to Moraga to go have their picture taken so it looks like they have their own wings. My 93-year-old my <laughs> dad did that just yesterday, and it's going to be something that I treasure forever. So to everyone in the Garden Club, I thank you, and we look forward to what you're up to next. So... Um, Thank you. Um, would uh, Bobby, Julie, any of you like to add a few words? Bobby. Um, you are all correct. It takes a village. Um, and this was certainly the case for this project. Um, I am so grateful to the town for its unwavering support from the very beginning, particularly Brianna and her fabulous staff, Kyle, Ruben, Jose, Raul, Justin, they were there every step of the sometimes extremely difficult way. Um, we had an amazing contractor, Andy Bagheri, the Moraga Park Foundation, um, and tons of volunteers from the Garden Club, but also the Moraga Service Clubs, the Scouts, and the community. And not just Moraga, we had volunteers from all over La Miranda. Um, this project truly did, as you said, Renata, create a camaraderie throughout the town. Um, I was a beneficiary of that. I would not have otherwise known the four very good friends that you see here with me tonight, but for this project. So for me, that was the, that was the cherry on top. Uh, the wing sculpture, which was the gift of Norm and Janet Pease, um, has resulted in selfies now from three to 93. <laughs> the very first selfie was a three-year-old. 
and um, everyone loves it. The mosaic caterpillars and ladybugs that are the gift of the artist Mary Gillis are little hidden surprise gems in the garden. If you haven't found them yet, you have to look closely because the plants are going to make it harder soon. Um, we are so grateful that the town is so committed to protecting all pollinators, including monarchs. And we're very excited about welcoming everybody to the garden on June 5th. It will be a nice event. Thank you. And thank you to my four good friends who are sitting waiting to say words. I love you all. Thank you, Bobby. Uh, anyone else? Julie. I just wanted to say, you know, having grown up in this area, um, La Mirinda, but particularly Moraga's relationship with nature is priceless. It's so beautiful. So thank you to all, and that's with a capital A-L-L -L, around us who help facilitate the enjoyment of that relationship. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Good to have you. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you all. Um, and really appreciate you joining us tonight and, and congratulations and thank you for that wonderful garden. All right. Good night. Good night. Um, okay, next, next agenda item is um, a presentation on SB 1383 reducing short-lived climate pollutants in California. And we welcome Judith Silver, who is driving this effort for Recycle Smart. And we in Moraga are the beneficiaries of Judith's work. So um, Judith, welcome and please uh, thank you. take it away. Okay, thank you so much, Madam Mayor. It's really a pleasure to be here tonight and uh, all the council members. Um, I appreciate the invitation to be here to speak with you tonight about 1383. Um, I, I love coming after the um, dedication of the Monarch uh, Garden because um, this is just another way that we're trying to preserve our way of life and um, prosperity here for, for, you know, in California. So I'm Judith Silver. I've been with Recycle Smart for a couple of years. I'm the senior program manager. And uh, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about this law that consumes me every day. <laughs> so 1383, SB 1383, it's the most significant uh, waste reduction legislation to pass in California in the last 30 years. It establishes a target to reduce um, by 75% the statewide disposal of organic waste from 2014 levels by 2025. It also includes a, a target, a statewide target that not less than 20% of currently disposed edible food be recovered for human consumption by 2025. And as you can see from this slide, 18% um, of food waste of food waste represents 18% of our waste stream. Um, and the idea of focusing on getting organics out of the landfill makes sense from a waste diversion perspective and from a greenhouse gas emission reduction perspective. So this slide talks a little bit about um, how 1383 affects pretty much everybody. It, it places obligations on local governments. It places obligations on facilities and on generators. Um, I wanna call out the Recycle Smart board. Um, so Moraga is a one of the five members of Recycle Smart, or I should say six. Um, so it's the La Mirinda communities, Walnut Creek and Danville and some portions of un unincorporated county. So that's our, the county is our sixth member, um, adopted a, a, an ordinance at the December uh, meeting. This is a required ordinance by, of 1383 um, to, that the, to, to take on the responsibilities of SB 1383. And the member agencies are not required to adopt this ordinance by reference. Um, the ordinance compels generators to separate organics. That's, that's the main thrust of this bill, of this law, and to keep them from landfill. And it gives our agency the ability to request records and information to meet our reporting obligations on your behalf. Um, the next slides lay out the responsibilities of Recycle Smart, of our generators, and the member agencies. But before we proceed, I just would like to call out that in almost every way, 
um, Recycle Smart and the member agencies are already in compliance. So we're in really good shape. Um, I just wanna make sure that is clearly conveyed. So the cornerstone of the law is the requirement that all generators, that's multifamily tenants, uh, commercial businesses, students, residents, um, townhome residents, that everybody have the opportunity and a way to separate organics from landfill. And through our agency's franchise with Republic Services, we, we already have that. And our carts are already the right colors as prescribed in the law. So um, that's, that's a big plus for us. Um, SB 13A3 describes specific actions that generators must comply with, such as the separation of organics from landfill, um, annual education of tenants about um, this requirement, and participation of certain businesses in food recovery. And I want to point out that with this law, multifamily tenants must also participate in food scrap and food soil paper diversion. Um, up until now, multifamily tenants could opt out and just have landscape trimmings, but that's no longer the case. And the ordinance gives our agency the right to inspect generators and to verify compliance and to enforce on them if that becomes necessary beginning in 2024. So now I wanna turn attention to what our agency is doing uh, for you and for the community. Um, so thanks to the foresight of the Recycle Smart Board over the last 10 years, we are currently in compliance with the existing collection approach that we've laid out that, we, that you all experience day to day. Um, this is paid already paid for through the rates and it's executed by our service partners, Republic Services and Mount Diablo Recycling. And I just wanna say that this is in comparison to many jurisdictions, particularly in Southern California, who are really uh, looking at some very new expensive costs to purchase trucks and carts and whatnot to implement uh, the programs that this, that this law requires statewide. I also want to call out that this law, um, that recently in the last state budget, there was money put aside uh, to be administered by CalRecycle through a block grant to assist local governments with, with uh, implementation. And I really want to appreciate Brett Swain from your team and also all the other member agencies who applied on behalf of Recycle Smart. Um, and most of those funds will come to Recycle Smart so that we can uh, do some of the program implementation without having any rate, any any significant rate impacts. So um, here are some of the things that Recycle Smart is working on. Um, one of the things I just want to call out is that um, there is an opportunity for small businesses if they generate less than 10 gallons of organics weekly to get a waiver. So we will be providing waivers to some small businesses, definitely not anyone who's in the food generating business, uh, but this will bring some relief um, when we can um, justify it to some of the smaller businesses in our service area. Uh, Recycle Smart is required to educate each year about proper separation of materials and why this is important. And this includes things like food waste prevention, um, ways to make sure you, uh, sh you know, shop your fridge first and that, that type of messaging. Um, and we also want to give tools to um, businesses um, and such as like signage and educational visuals. Uh, videos and other technical assistance to help the businesses uh, execute their obligation to educate their tenants about this law. Um, there is a, a thing called a capacity analysis, which we're just launching um, in our office right now. And this is an, um, the idea here is that we're gonna do an analysis of how, of how much we're, uh, organics we've recovered and how we're going to find homes for that. Um, that's on the processing side is taken care of through our franchise. And we're also doing that for edible food recovery. So we're looking at ways that the infrastructure for recovered food exists and to make sure that we can um, find home, find ways to, um, to help businesses know where that food should go and how that should be handled properly. SB 1383 requires annual route auditing. And so we just completed a, um, a pilot um, in earlier in February to test a protocol that we used a contractor to help us develop. And we will be um, 
this is an an opportunity for us to provide educational feedback in the form of cart tags or or emails back to residents or businesses. This is not meant to um, create a a fine or or anything like that, but it's a way for us to see, you know, are are, are there food scraps in the trash that we'd like to see in the organics? How can we convey that to the resident that this is where we'd like to see this? It's also an opportunity to say, hey, we don't want to see any batteries in your trash. So um, we're, we're very uh, cognizant of, of privacy issues and we're, and we're doing this. We're not taking any pictures. We're, we're trying to be very careful, but this is a requirement of the law and it's a great way for us to do some education and, and direct feedback about what we're seeing. Um, and we are required to, to go to every route every year. We have 68 routes in, in our service area. So that's a bit of a lift. So so to recap, um, we have passed this required ordinance and over the next couple of years, we are going to be pushing outreach and education. And then in 2024, we have the the obligation to to enact enforcement if we need to. However, it's our feeling that we are, you know, we have a mature program where this is not new in our service area. Moraga has been doing this for a long time. We're, we're not expecting to, there to be a lot of enforcement, but we need to be prepared for that should that become uh, something that we need to do. So um, SB 1383 is very prescriptive. Um, there's a lot of record keeping and we're working with staff at each of our member agencies so that they understand um, their obligations to help us report on their on your behalf so that we can uh, give CalRecycle what we need, what they need um, so that they're satisfied with all of us. Um, I want to call out one of the most interesting parts for us of 1383 is that we're now in the edible food recovery business. And we've been spending the last few years developing the relationships with um, edible food partners uh, in in our service area and um, basically covered generators. um, And I'll describe who a covered generator is in the next few slides have to have a like a service agreement in place such that if there is an opportunity to to give extra food, if there is excess food, they know who to go to and they and they know exactly what to do so that that food can be recovered. Um, we have that, that this aspect of the law has a, uh, a monitoring and an enforcement piece associated with it. And we're very pleased that Contra Costa Health Services has agreed to partner with us and to serve in that capacity. And we're working on a contract with them to do that for us. And that's an excellent, you know, the right people to be in the business, in front of businesses and businesses already listen to them. So that's a, that's a very exciting development. Um, This slide calls out who are the tier one and tier two type of businesses. And I'm just gonna quickly switch to this next slide that talks a little bit more in detail. Tier one businesses are required now to be doing as much food recovery as possible. And these are sort of the larger, you know, supermarket type businesses, wholesalers, that type of thing. Tier two businesses are restaurants, local education agencies, smaller businesses, more prepared food, if you will. Tier ones are more about, you know, sort of more bulk, larger items. Um, Okay, here's the one tier one business in Moraga. Um, so I'm, I'm not too concerned. And I know that the Safeway store is already uh, has regular food recovery with the muffin people. So um, we're in good shape there. We just have to make sure that the service agreement is in place. And here is the list of the tier two businesses in Moraga. Um, and you can see that they're mostly schools. And, and Brett actually asked me the question, like, well, we don't have any control over the schools um, because they're, they're, you know, they're, they're, they can do more pretty much what they want to do. And so in terms of food recovery, um, we will make sure, it's our obligation to make sure that they have education, um, which we've already been sending them letters and and making sure they understand that this is a requirement come 2024. Um, If there happens to be a need for enforcement, if for some reason one of the schools isn't interested in, in participating in food recovery, we would then refer them to the state for enforcement, but we're not really expecting that to happen. Um, and we've been working with St. Mary's College where I'm developing that relationship and with uh, the Moraga Country Club as well. So there's, it's not a huge lift, in, in, especially in your community. There's, there's many more um, restaurants in other places that in, you know, in Lafayette and Walnut Creek who are covered under this law. So to turn my attention now to the to the responsibilities that still rest on the shoulders of the individual member agencies, so your responsibilities in Moraga, 
Um, there are a few, and I, I really want to appreciate all the staff uh, in Moraga who have been helping us kind of uh, get ready. And one of the things is the Cal Green requirement, which has been a program that we've had in place for a long time, and that's just going to continue on, and that's going really well, and that's making sure that we're making sure that um, construction and demolition debris is recovered um, and that we can track that, and um, your staff is working with us on that. Um, Afshan has helped put together the ordinance for the for the water um, efficient landscape ordinance that's required under 1383. So I know that's come before you and you've had your, I think your second reading already. So that's wonderful. Um, we've been working with Brett and Annie on making sure there's a clear understanding of the recycled content paper requirement that all paper purchased by the city, all different departments, all types of paper need to have recycled content, or we need to be able to prove that it was too expensive. Um, and, you know, and, and we've also been working with Cynthia on your uh, environmental purchasing policy and making sure that the language there um, includes reference to SB 1383 and those obligations. So um, we're making great strides uh, in Moraga and I'm, I'm sure that, you know, that everything is in place. I'm not concerned about it. Lastly, I just want to call out another aspect of 1383 that does rest with the member agencies. And this is the obligation that um, is the idea here is of closing the loop. So the idea is that each based on population, each uh, jurisdiction is required to purchase a certain amount of, of compost basically, or an equivalent organic waste product um, to kind of drive demand for organic materials. Um, and we worked with um, Republic Services to come up with a, a, a kind of a way to, so that you don't have to purchase it directly yourselves, but that Republic, when they're selling the finished compost that we bring to their facility, will that the folks who are purchasing that already will be buying that on your behalf. And that's a, a sort of a nice feature of SB 1383. It's a direct service provider feature. And um, that will save you from having to purchase 780 tons of finished compost, which uh, has a market value of around $10,000. So that's, we're, we're testing this out in, in year one. We assume we're, we're, we're pretty confident that this will, will um, work for you and for all the member agencies and save you having to purchase that compost. So um, that's very good. We're very pleased about that. And then finally, I would be remiss if I didn't just sort of say that Cal Recycle does have the right to enforce on, on Recycle Smart and on each member agency if they're not satisfied with the work that we're doing. Um, however, I feel like it's extremely unlikely we're sort of a, I wouldn't say a poster child, but our, our service area is very well respected for the forward thinking and uh, way that we're already, I um, mean, all, all the communities in the Bay Area are so much farther ahead than places in Southern California, but I just wanna make sure that I have articulated that. And that concludes my presentation. I know that's a lot. And so um, I'm happy to take questions and I can stop screen sharing. Thank you, Judith. Um, yeah, you know. if you would stop screen sharing, that would yeah. be awesome. Thank you. Do we have any questions from council members? So. Thank you. That was super helpful. Hopefully this is just a quick one quick answer. So the yep. record keeping obligations, do any of that fall on the small businesses or commercial entities or that's at the municipal level? That's at the municipal level. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. We have things we need to ask of small businesses, but we, there's no specific requirements. I mean, if, if a business is self-hauling or back-hauling their material, they do need to maintain records of where they bring that material. And so if we have the right to ask them for that. Mm -hmm. um, but um, we don't have a lot of that in our service area. Thank you. Other questions? Steve. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Judith, you know, thank you and, and, and thank, you, thank you for the many years that um, there have been a lot of different programs in La Mirinda related, or Moraga at least, that I'm familiar with, related to uh, recycling. And um, I'm, I'm quite pleased with what we currently have. The question I have is, um, relates to balancing recycling, food, uh, organics, et cetera, 
um, with the fuel required to run the trucks around? And, and you know, is there been any cost benefit analysis done comparing, comparing the two, recognizing both have, uh, uh, you know, potentially significant impact on the environment? One of them we know has a significant impact on the environment. Yeah, I mean, everything has a significant impact on the environment. I think, you know, one of the things that we don't talk about so much when we're talking about this law is that, um, yeah, I'm not really answering your question, but I just want to say this because I just thinking about it is that um, everything we can do to keep material out of the landfill keeps our landfill open longer. And the, and when, and and luckily there's, we actually have a fair amount of shelf life on our the landfill at Keller Canyon landfill. But when that landfill does eventually get full, um, the, the, that's, then, then we're going to be driving really, really far to take, to take stuff to landfill. So that, that's sort of just another added benefit. But I mean, in terms of, I mean, I, I would say if, if that's a concern, I would encourage you to, to do as much backyard composting as you have, because then you can actually get a discount on your, on your bill. And that would keep all of those organics, you know, very, very close to home and, and reduce the amount of impact in that regard. But, you know, I, I don't really feel like I can, I would have to really think about that question. I don't. Yeah. And, and I'm, I'm thinking at a more macro level where, yeah. uh, for example, yeah. in power, you know, if the if analogy of using electrical power, uh, the future may be more uh, uh, distributed uh, power plants. And, mm -hmm. and so are, would right. there be opportunities to have uh, more local uh, organic composting facilities where the collected materials are taken and composted. Uh, so I, I think what I'm hearing is that hasn't been uh, uh, seriously uh, looked at or, or, or offset. And, you know, pretty soon uh, that diesel is going to cost that much more. It yeah. already is, and it's going to get worse. Right. Yeah, well, I, I firmly believe that backyard composting is a good answer for you because that's going to help keep that. Well, and yeah. then. We do have a program that's pretty unique in our service area. I'm not sure if you're familiar with our food recycling project that um, there are about 500 businesses in our entire service area where food scraps, and I know there are some in Moraga as well, and food scraps are collected and taken to East Bay Mud um, to their anaerobic digester and they're co-digested mm -hmm. there and that creates energy and we actually share in a, in a, in a, in a uh, energy share with East Bay Mud and helps power their plant. So that is that is a very uh, uh, local program. Um, it is true that the compost facility is pretty far away. Um, so, but please understand, it's not the individual trucks that are driving out to our compost facility. That they are um, everything is uh, brought to our transfer station in Martinez, and then you know at capacity, those trucks are driving out. But yeah, it's it's yeah, a yeah. thing. It's a thing. Thank you. Thank you. Any other council member questions? Okay, I'll open it up for public comment. Any public comment on this matter? Seeing no hands, I will close public comment. Any council member comments? Mike. I'll just say thank you. I wanna thank you for uh, everything you do. And I uh, you know, heard you know, very high regard of Recycle Smart from council members and residents. So thank you. Anyone else? Steve. I, I just echo that, uh, especially, you know, historically so much, you know, we are a land of excess and so much of our food gets wasted. And um, we, you know, whatever we can do to reduce that is, I'm all for it. And I do, do I do, we do have our, our compost in the side yard. So we're, we're there. Why am I not surprised? <laughs> <laughs> Teresa. Um, Judith, thank you, Madam Mayor. Could you tell us a little, tell everyone a little bit about White Pony? Yeah, absolutely. So White Pony Express is a uh, local food recovery organization um, and, and there's white and you guys have muffin people in your service area, in our service area as well. But White Pony, we partnered with White Pony and got a food rescue grant um, from Cal Recycle um, 
uh, so they're using that money to help build the infrastructure so that they can, you know, do more food recovery. Um, they are looking for volunteers. If you want to volunteer, you can go onto their website. You can sign up to get pinged when they need a food run, um, and that helps, you know, uh, pick up food from from uh, the area. And uh, yeah, they're very mission driven, and we're really excited about our partnership with them. So. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I just want to add that, um, you know, as I'm listening to you, Judith, and, and in my involvement with Recycle Smart over the last few years, I think this is an example, the organization is an example where pooling of resources and sharing of services among uh, cities and towns is beneficial to each of our communities. So as you were saying, Judith, you know, Recycle Smart does procurement of recycling, composting, and other services on behalf of Orinda, Lafayette, Moraga, Unincorporated Contra Costa County, and Walnut Creek. And it's making sure uh, that all of its members are complying with the many state laws in this area. Now, if that compliance function was left to each of the separate jurisdictions, I think that would be particularly difficult. I think it would be inefficient. It would not be cost effective, and and the um, and compliance could be uneven because everybody adopts their own standards. So the fact that Recycle Smart is doing this on behalf of all of the member jurisdictions, I think, is cost effective and is beneficial to to everybody who uh, is in the Recycle Smart service area. So um, I just think that as this legislation on on recycling, composting, organics, and and who knows what else is coming down the pike from Sacramento because this is 1383 is not the last thing we're going to see. I think this compliance role that Recycle Smart plays on behalf of the member jurisdictions is is absolutely critical and important. And so so Judith, thank you uh, so much for for everything you guys are doing. Thank you. All right. Um, I guess that's it on that agenda item. Thank you, Judith. It was really good to have you. You're welcome Appreciate to stay it. for as long oh, as you want, but you're also welcome to leave. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was great to have you. All right. Uh, thank you. The next uh, agenda item, public comments and suggestions. This is time reserved for those in the audience who wish to address the council on items that are not on the agenda. Any Yes, Mike. A, a point of order. It, it, could I say a couple words, Madam Mayor? Absolutely. Go ahead. Yeah, I just want to say uh, on this agenda item here, um, you know, we're here to work for the residents of Morag and we're here to listen. Um, we have in our protocols uh, civility to work with each other, staff, and the residents. And we've been trying to, you know, double our efforts for civility here in, in town government. And I'd just like to say, you have every right to, to criticize, to protest, to say what you'd like to say, but um, sometimes those comments seem to go a little bit over the line, um, if I'm being honest. So I would just like to ask residents, would you please make your points um, and try to redouble efforts on civility and let's just have a conversation of community partners. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, appreciate that. Um, all right, any public comment, any raised hands? I don't see any. Okay, then I will close public comment. Next agenda item, adoption of the consent agenda. Do council member, anybody wanna pull anything? Mike. Yes, yeah, 6.4. 6.4, okay. Any others? Okay. Uh, yes, Steve. Uh, ready to make a motion? Please, ready? thank you. I move approval of the consent agenda items 6.1, 6.2, 6.3, 6.5, 6.6, 6.6, and 6.7 as proposed. Okay, motion by Steve. Do we have a second from Council Member Onoda? Uh, all right, any public comment? No. All right, roll call vote. Council Member Macker? Yes. Council Member Onoda? Yes. Council Member McClure? Yes. Vice Mayor Willkie? Yes. Mayor Sauce? Yes. It carries unanimously. Mike, 6.4. Uh, 
Yeah, I, I guess th there's a, a question in my mind of um, returning to in-person meetings um, sooner. Um, I see the staff report and um, the, the letter uh, attached as of February 2nd. Uh, I didn't see though the um, press release from the Contra Costa County Health Department on 2-9 uh, effectively saying um, 2-16, you know, there is no mask requirements. Uh, further, I did not see the California Department of Public Health saying um, there is no further mask requirements, um, though people you know, have options here. I'm hearing more and more questions about, okay, well, when's Moraga going to open up in person? So I wanted to pull it. Um, you know, I, I think you know, we're, we're ready. I, there's always risk. But um, if we're saying we're not having masks indoor, the the schools are stopping masks this week. Um, they're gonna have musicals at Campo. You can go in shopping malls, um, sporting events. So I, I would really like to suggest that um, we accelerate this in-person meeting process. And I'd love to hear from my colleagues. Uh, before we do that, um, I would invite Cynthia because uh, spoiler alert, Cynthia had something to say about this in her report. So if you would, uh, if it, you can indulge the council and and do that piece of it now, I think it might answer your questions, Mike. Okay. Yeah. So um, cities are starting to go back to in-person meetings, although half of the cities in Contra Costa still are doing virtual meetings. Um, we are um, setting the goal for the March 23rd meeting to have that meeting be in person. Uh, but we do recommend that you adopt um, this um, uh, resolution because we're not quite sure what's gonna happen in the future and we want to be ready should we need to go back to virtual meetings. So let's hope we don't. And um, we are kind of working on the protocols and the room set up. Um, and I believe I've spoke to most of you uh, about that. And we don't have any pre-existing health conditions that prevent the council from gathering. So plan to meet at the council chambers at 6.30 on March 23rd. And, and if Cynthia, if, if I may, um, I, I think we need to adopt 6.4 in order to have this meeting be yes. on Zoom. Yes, yes. Oh. And we will probably <laughs> yeah. continue to bring that this on a, you have to bring this every 30 days and we'll probably continue to bring this so that we can continue to have virtual meetings. And, and I think that virtual meetings are gonna be something that some of our commissions are gonna wanna continue to hold and that some meetings we might find are um, a better way to um, get community input. So I think that it's it's opened up a new tool for us to use. So um, definitely the council I think needs to go back to in-person meetings, um, but uh, this will be an option. So if I understand what you're saying, Cynthia, that the by adopting this declaration or, or continuing to adopt it, it doesn't mean we have to do Zoom meetings. It just means that there is the option to do that. Right, and we wanted, like I said, we also want to do that and we'll continue to do that for our boards and commissions and some of our community meetings that, that we will be holding virtually. Mike, are you, is the, does that- I'm fine, uh, I'm fine. Sorry for spoiler alert. <laughs> no, no, it, it, was, it was a perfect segue into, into <laughs> that part of Cynthia's report. So we just, just, just took care of it more quickly in the meeting. All right, uh, Mike, would you like to make a motion to adopt? Yes, I'd like to make a motion to approve consent item 6.4. I second. Uh, motion, uh, Council Member McClure, second Council Member Onoda, any public comment? Denise, you have public comment? That was it. <laughs> oh, <laughs> public comment that there be public comment. Okay, uh, I see no raised hands. Uh, so I'll bring it back, roll call vote. Council Member Macker? Yes. Council Member Onoda? Yes. Council Member McClure? Yes. Vice Mayor Wolke? Yes. Mayor Sauce is a yes, carries unanimously. The consent items are adopted. Okay, adoption of meeting agenda. Can I have a motion? A, a, a point of order, um, Madam yes, Mayor. Yes, Mike. I noticed last meeting and this meeting, there's been a change in the format of the agenda. It's it's small, but it's a change, and uh, I'm just you know usually that would be a discussion and a vote by the town council. The the changes under reports, we used to have council members go first, and then the um, 
the town manager and now it's been switched. So uh, I just want to understand um, what's changed here. Um, I, I did not, that, that was not a, a substantive change. So I d did not believe that it, I mean, it, it was something that was within the presiding officer's discretion. And um, the thinking behind that is that the town manager um, has, you know, important stuff for the community to hear and for us mm -hmm. to either echo or further comment on. So um, I thought it was worth trying to have the town manager go first. Yeah, I, I would recommend usually any change to the agenda structure is a council discussion and decision. I just think even though it's relatively small, um, I, I think we should have that perhaps as a future agenda item if this is going to be permanent. Well, we, my can, suggestion. we can figure we can figure that out whether that that actually is, my understanding was that was not required. So that's that's why it was made without without discussion because it was a kind of a ministerial and not a, a substantive point. Mm -hmm. Do would you like to make a motion to change the order? Uh, I'll leave. It's just if this is going to be permanent, it's my opinion that there should be a discussion, but okay. I'll leave it for now. Thank you. Is there a motion to adopt? Um, I'm sorry? So moved. Thank you, Teresa. M motion is second. M Macker, uh, Councilmember Nota, motion. Councilmember Macker, second. Uh, uh, public comment. Roll call vote. Councilmember Macker? Yes. Councilmember Nota. Yes. Councilmember McClure? Yes. Uh, Vice Mayor Wallachie? Yes. Uh, Mayor Saw says a yes. The agenda is adopted unanimously. All right, reports. Our next town manager, please. Great. So uh, mark your calendars. Next <laughs> meeting in person. That's the first thing. But I have wanted to talk to you a little bit more about calendars as well. So, um, uh, earlier this year at your first January meeting on January 12th, we distributed the uh, meeting calendar for the year. And that meeting calendar included um, the whole dates for the second and fourth Wednesday of the month for the regularly scheduled council meetings. And this year we did it a little bit differently and we asked you to hold the first and the third Wednesday of the month um, because we have quite a few special and closed session meetings this, this year in particular. And we've been having uh, a hard time uh, scheduling those meetings and finding times for those. So we're just trying to facilitate that process. Um, the reason why we have quite a few more meetings this year is we have uh, the housing element update and the Bollinger Canyon rezone. And those were, um, we have quite a few joint planning commission and town council meetings. We also have the um, traffic uh, study coming up. We're gonna have a couple meetings related to that. We have uh, labor negotiations and other closed session items. And the council has provided feedback that having those closed session items for 30 to 60 minutes before council meetings just really doesn't give us enough time. So we've asked you to put those meetings on hold. So we will let you know when something's scheduled. And if that meeting doesn't work for y'all, then we will go ahead and schedule it for another time. So if you could just do that. And I think that mostly this will be for the first, you know, um, through uh, the council recess which is July 15th, because things um, we, we end up often uh, with the budget, just having a lot of items prior to that, that time. So we are, will be bringing um, the budget to you. We usually have like a, a pre-budget discussion of general items and questions of what you want to want to fund. Um, we'll be looking to bring that to you in May. And we'll be looking to bring the CIP budget to you actually for discussion, um, I think on April 27th. So that will come a little bit earlier. We want to make sure that you get the updates about the um, Worst First Streets program. And that's coming um, later this month. So lots of um, information that we'll be bringing to you for your consideration to set you up to make those budgeting decisions. Um, and then I also just wanted to do a quick shout out that um, MOFD 
had a wildfire prevention meeting last night, and they have another meeting tomorrow night to discuss the proposed changes to their maps to uh, uh, designate additional areas in Moraga as very high fire severity zones. So they'll have, it's a community meeting, all the information is available on MOFD's website. And it's also, um, we've sent that out on our About Town. So I hope you're enjoying our weekly issues of About Town and that you're finding them more informative. And, um, you know, we're, we're active on Facebook, so, and um, Twitter. Oh, and I had a couple other general things. Okay, so hold on a second. Um, there was a quick power outage today um, because a car hit a power pole, but that power came back on right away. Um, actually, our public works department said uh, wanted me to share that um, we have doubled the number of permits that we've issued um, in the first three months or the first uh, two months of this year we've already issued more permits than we issued for all of 2020 and 2021. So there's a lot of activity happening now, a lot of investment. Um, and uh, as you noted from the last About Town, we're bringing back all of our summer and spring event events. And um, that's really being embraced by the community. So we're excited about that. And on Monday, our Balancing Act tool opened. So we still have our housing survey available. And then we have this new balancing act tool where we're asking residents and, and people who work here as well to let us know um, where they want the housing to be. Um, so we will continue to make that available. Um, we've had, we're continuing to have a great response on the housing survey over 700 responses so far so that's great but we're really looking for renters so we could use help in that area and that is the end of my report thank you very much uh, you guys were so fast i don't know it was a photo finish steve, mike and steve, steve went steve was ahead uh, just just confirmation uh cynthia and i think you i heard when you talked about permits being doubled you said public works department or was it yeah was this it is their encroachment permits i'm sorry their encroachment permits encroachment permits okay huh? encroachment permits yeah all the work that people are doing in the public right away so we have oh it's it's twice as many uh this year as we did for the first quarters of 2020 and 2021 so a lot of work a lot of investment. I don't know if it's in people's sidewalks or streets or storm or sewer laterals. ADUs? Nope. No? Nope, that's planning. Well, I understand. Steve, okay, I thanks. think we only have like three ADUs. So we're not we're not seeing the big uptick in ADUs yet. Yeah. I think it's where they're splitting the lots and putting in uh, eight eight. Unit. We have not received any SB9 <laughs> applications yet. I think two inquiries, but no applications. Right. Any other questions, Steve? No. Mike. Okay, thank you. Troublemaker, Steve. Uh, <laughs> I, yeah, I want to I wanna just understand where we are in the calendar. There's actually two calendars out there, just so that we're clear. I got a calendar hard copy in my package that did not say to hold the first and third Wednesdays. And you pointed out recently the link to me. So um, that is problematic. But if you're saying if a council member can't attend the Wednesday, first or third Wednesday for special or closed session, that staff will reschedule it. And it could be a Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, next Wednesday, whatever, but staff will do their best to reschedule that meeting. Am I understanding that correct? That is correct. But if a council member says it's fine, go ahead without me, then we'll make the decision whether to go ahead without them or not. So um, I think that there was some confusion because we did hear back from a council member who said, I can't attend and please go ahead without me. So, right. but if they want to attend, then we'll absolutely go find a date when everybody can attend because it's important that everybody be able to participate in closed session as well as special meetings. 
Right. And so I think that's fine. And, and also when we set these, if there's a way we can find out what the topics are, because that could be helpful. You can call future. me anytime when you get a inquiry, if you're available for a meeting, if it's not in the email from Marty, please feel free to call me and I'm happy to speak to you about it. Okay. Thank you very much. Does that clarify things, Mike, for you? Sure does. Okay. Outstanding. Um, any other questions of Cynthia before we move on. Thank you, Cynthia, some good news in there. Um, all right, um, Council Member Macker. Sure, thank you. I'll keep my report pretty brief. Uh, I, last week, like all my fellow council members attended the joint meeting last week with the Planning Commission on the housing site discussion. That was, that was one of the most clear presentations about RENA and the housing element, and I just wanted to call a, a attention to that um, for anyone in the public looking to really better understand and learn about it. The, that presentation was fantastic to get that full overview. And then um, I've been doing my part the best I can to try to spread the word about the uh, Make Moraga Home survey, in particular amongst the groups um, that Cynthia mentioned, like renters. End of report. Thank you, Sona. Teresa. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, mine will also be brief. Um, I, like Sona said, um, attended March 2nd's Town Council and Planning Commission meeting about housing. And I really want to applaud staff and planning and council because that was a fabulous meeting. You know, I, I don't know when I've attended a meeting that was so well put together and was so on target. It was really, really great. Um, and then on the 6th, March 6th, I attended a vir Virgil, no, a vigil, vigil, thank you, um, in Lafayette at the Crosses for Ukraine. And mm. it was, it was really pretty wonderful. Um, people spoke who were from Ukraine or who had relatives in Ukraine or who had worked in Ukraine. It was it was really a a, a good um, a, um, community meeting, and it was at the perfect spot too. You know the crosses. I, I you know I've never really pulled over and spent any time there, but it was the perfect spot for that. So end of report. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. Mike. Thank you. Um, just very quickly, I mentioned uh, in, in my conversation with the J principal, John Walker Campo, this is the last week for masks at school and in-person musicals will, will start um, as well. I attended the uh, community, uh, excuse me, the Chamber of um, Commerce um, meeting, board meeting. Uh, they had a robbery in their office in Ream. Uh, their office was ransacked. Um, their laptop was stolen, uh, the checkbook was stolen. So they were scrambling to get the checks changed and um, stop orders and sign new um, um, signature cards. So um, it, it, it's been uh, difficult. Uh, they're also been trying to set up a separate line for the Chamber of Commerce because now there is no phone line. So they just, so you know, they continue to be at the basics of rebuilding the Chamber like many businesses are. Um, they are moving forward and trying to focus on the Moraga Citizen of the Year, as well as the Moraga Nonprofit or Business um, of the Year. Um, they are working on a program and presentation, as the council asked at the previous meeting, to help Moraga uh, businesses, and they're um, talking with the town manager for input. Uh, on a related item, the um, New Delhi Bistro in Moraga has closed. Um, Community Service Day had a kickoff meeting um, last week with many items, and next steps will be to um, get a more detailed draft of projects uh, starting in early April. I, too, attended the uh, joint housing meeting. Yes, um, very well done. And I thought people asked good questions um, and a lot of interesting new information. And people talked about that, too. And it's good to hear new information. Uh, I will share that I did talk to um, Jay Kerner and Dave Brizzoni before that meeting because I wanted to get their input on what they thought 
of um, the report, uh, as I'm here to listen to all stakeholders. Uh, and since I was asked to give direction, I wanted to take their comments into account. Um, okay, so now my last item here, re you know, residents, you know, have asked about um, the agenda item that the town council approved with priority for uh, measure, measure K um, policy. Um, I see it's not on the agenda tonight. We've had other agenda items that didn't have priority as this one's had. So um, I think we need to have a discussion on this and there's an agenda item in April that will let us have that discussion instead of um, doing that now, which we can't. End of report, thank you. Thank you, Mike. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so I wanna talk about just uh, one communication uh, and that was with Scott Parker. Uh, all town council members, I believe, received an email from Scott uh, last couple of days, and I, I was really impressed. Uh, and Scott was featured, I guess, in La Mirinda Weekly in January. Somehow I missed that. Uh, but over a three-month period, he picked up years of trash over a range of locations, uh, Los Trampas Creek area in uh, Lafayette, uh, moving up to Moraga, uh, Bollinger Canyon uh, watershed area, uh, Moraga Creek, uh, uh, Laguna Creek, or uh, Los Trampa, uh, yeah, Laguna Creek, uh, the, the lot next to uh, the, the, uh, the movie theater and, and also out towards Canyon. Um, he picked up a lot of trash, um, and and I um, I asked him, you know, well, driver for it, and and, and it's just a, a question of being altruistic. Uh, he thinks that we really ought to have a better better uh, management of, of trash. Uh, he's interested in, you know, how how can the town uh, achieve that. Uh, and we, we had some discussions about that, and that's going to have to be an ongoing thing, um, you know, be it annual or, or part of a community day that uh, has been raised. And I think that's a potential opportunity. Um, the other thing, uh, oh, he wanted to uh, especially recognize that he got help from a number of entities, including the town of Moraga uh, Public Works, and once he retrieve the trash from down in the creek, and some of it was pretty heavy stuff, uh, Public Works helped in, in, in uh, uh, disposing of, of much of the trash. Uh, some of it he took to metal recyclers. Um, very, very impressive. Um, the other thing, I, you know, in, in my mind is that we need to find a way to recognize uh, people that uh, take the initiative to do things like this, um, you know, short of, uh, uh, you know, a, a, you know, a, a declaration. I've got some ideas and I'll pursue those as, as the year progresses. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Um, so my report will be, it will be quick. Um, I was absolutely delighted to get the March 3rd issue of About Town and to see all of the summer activities that are coming back after a two year hiatus, concerts, 4th of July, all of the traditions that are bring such joy to the kids in this community and to the family. So really looking forward to the summer. Um, I also attended the March 2nd joint planning session uh, on the housing opportunity sites with the planning commission. I'm going to echo what others have said. The, the presentation was fantastic. So those of you, uh, we had a lot of people uh, online with us and really appreciate their participation. For those of you who missed it, it is it was recorded and you just have to watch the first 45 minutes um, and get and just a terrific overview. Of, of what the what the key considerations and issues are. And there is, of course, uh, as has been mentioned, continuing opportunity for public comment. There's the housing survey, which we really encourage people to fill out. You can get to it through the website. Then there's this um, the Balancing Act tool, which just went live yesterday, uh, which gives people the opportunity to, to move houses around town. And that those are not the only opportunities for public input. Every meeting that we have about this over the next year, 
with the Planning Commission and Planning Commission meetings are all public meetings. So uh, there will continue to be information pushed out to the community and input will continue to be gathered in an active way from the community. Um, and then just on a personal note, um, I, I just want to say as the child of Ukrainian immigrants, I have been absolutely touched and moved by the community's support. Um, and, um, and, and Teresa, thank you for going to the gathering in Lafayette. I was planning to go, but instead I spent that day in the emergency room with one of my dogs. So, um, in, in, and she's fine. <laughs> <laughs> but but again, I, I just want to thank everyone in the community for for their their open hearts and their their compassion and concern. Uh, that is the end of my report. Um, all right, we have public hearings next. There are none. Next item: ordinances, resolutions, requests for action, annual road rehabilitation, and storm drain program. Poll of the council. Would you guys like a five minute break before we take that on, or should we keep going? I saw one strong yes. I, 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 yeah, and, and I, yeah, I've got a thumbs up. Okay, good. Thank you. 810, let's reconvene. Thank you. Thank All right. you. All right, we're back. Uh, we're on item 10A, annual, annual road rehabilitation and storm drain program. Uh, Sean, are you doing the staff report? Yes, I am. So welcome. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor and council members. So I have a brief presentation. There's an item for your consideration to award a um, design engineering contract, um, but let's get into the short presentation and we can go from there. So. I'll try to share the screen right now. Give me a moment here. So hopefully you see a full screen. That do, does everyone see a full screen of the yes. presentation? Okay, thank you. All right, so um, tonight we're just we're going to go briefly. Uh, ARPA funding of our storm drain program, talk about some of the other things also in our storm drain program. Um, I, it was good for us to, I thought, to go back a little bit and kind of recap how we got to this point and what we've been doing so we understand where we're going with the program. So uh, these are some photos from our uh, Green Boulevard sinkhole repair. It was a quite uh, massive project. It's, re it's the sinkhole number two. Uh, which is some 40 feet down below the, the pavement surface. As you can see, yeah, we had to take multiple ladders to get down there. Hmm. And we'll see if we can get the, get the, there we go. So if we can go back a little bit in time, um, the town was diligently collecting information about the storm drain system and that, uh, that effort started with the Moraga Storm Drain Master Plan completed in, in July of 2015. And that came up with a estimated annual budget of about $785,000 of capital improvements to fix deficient storm drain system and pipes. And that was based on an estimate uh, of the system would also have capacity issues that there are a number of undersized pipes, including the deficient pipes that were existing that would need to be upsized and upgraded. Uh, we, we then went into 2019 and uh, completed an addendum to the storm drain master plan and looked more in detail, including doing extensive mapping of the system, which we, we pulled, out, pulled out those uh, storm drain inlets and, and manholes and, and got in there and identified size of pipes, locations of pipes, materials of pipes, lengths of pipes as part of the update of the, of the master plan with the addendum. And we lowered the priority for capacity projects, revised our CIP estimates, and came out with a recommended $540,000 annually in capital investments in the O&M. 
also developed a storm drain operations and maintenance plan, which uh, would entail uh, inspecting about 5,000 linear feet of storm drain pipe uh, annually, uh, prioritizing the high risk pipes, which are corrugated metal pipes. And through our uh, inventory, we were able to determine the amount of uh, corrugated metal pipes and, and to our, you know, our good uh, uh, fortunes, the majority of the pipes are not, uh, they're only about 7% of the system are, are corrugated metal pipes. So that's the good news. Um, we also worked on how, how we were gonna analyze the information, how we're gonna analyze the pipes, what kind of systems we were gonna have in place and using the NASCA system of uh, analyzation of pipes, it's used for storm drains and sewer systems. And we'll prioritize cleaning and maintenance work. Uh, kind of the preventive pipe work that would help us prevent the major issues by doing inspections, keeping them clean and operating properly. So we developed an enhanced storm drain program that would proactively start addressing these with a smaller budget. Okay, and so from our, you know, in 2019 and 20, um, 2019 slash 20 fiscal years, we completed the management system, the database, the GIS database. We completed the mapping of our infrastructure by going out and determining where the infrastructure was and getting into our GIS system. And we completed that 2019 storm drain addendum. And then, then the town council allocated about $300,000 to the 2021 storm drain O&N program, which included a $30,000 contract to do inspections and cleanings. And from that inspection and videotaping, we developed a, you know, a list of projects based on what we found out there and developed the list of projects, which you're now seeing projects coming forth through design and construction as we move forward here. So that, this was the initial investment of the town recently to get the own in program and capital uh, improvement projects that result from these inspections going. We also trained our staff how to do confined space entry for the larger dammer pipes and train them on the systems for rating pipes. And I, want, I want to make it clear that you know, we have a very limited amount of uh, staff. We only have five uh, uh, maintenance workers, which we share between both our roads and our parks. And so uh, this, is, this training is really meant for emergency situations where we, we need to uh, determine what's happening on a certain pipe or we want to be you know, preactive. Um, and we don't have time to go out and hire somebody to do something, but we have the in-house trade and we do that. And uh, we've gone ahead and done that to make sure our staff is safe. So here's some of the activities that we've been completing in the last couple of years with our own activities. Of course, every year, our, our staff in the October, November period will go out and inspect all the catch basins, storm drain inlets, creeks that are in public property. We'll inspect those and have those clean prior to the winter and prior to the storms. And then during the storm events, our staff are out there uh, uh, going across the streets and looking for our problem areas and to make sure our storm drain catch basins and inlets are not clogged and flooding the street. And so we do that on an annual basis. And, and recently we've uh, had a number of inspections completed Okay, as part of our 2023 street rehabilitation, which is our worst first streets, we've inspected all the pipes underneath those streets. And we're going through and rating each of the pipes and determining which pipes need to be repaired as part of that project. We also have our annual inspections with a smaller contract that's also going to be occurring shortly here in February. And then tonight you're considering a, a proposal to do a much larger project, with, which will include inspections um, with the 2021-23 annual road rehabilitation and storm drain uh, repairs project. We'll talk about that more a little later here. So ongoing O&M um, activities, you know, our engineering maintenance staff proactively goes out and looks for uh, issues that might be occurring, whether they're on public property or private property, to have them properly abated. We do have a number of uh, times that we were called out by either by the public or we, our staff is out there and sees issues and we try to proactively 
address those before, before they become bigger problems. We do send notification letters to property owners of their responsibilities, both on private and public. In our situation, we'll take care of those issues, of course. And this, this comes about from about 20 storm drain related inquiries that we have through via um, open rod or other, other means. So now let's talk a little bit about ARPA has been able to provide us this one-time opportunity for some major investments in our storm drain system. We currently have a part-time limited duration uh, senior civil engineer running our expanded storm drain program, which uh, includes a number of projects that are funded through the CIP and the adopted budget. And we also have uh, into the future, we have uh, forecasted projects and one of them will be uh, correlating with the item tonight, um, potentially construction in the future. So we do have three projects currently that are funded. It's the drainage settlement and slide repair, the 2023 annual road rehabilitation design, and the Moraga Road and Hacienda drainage projects, both are up in the current funding. And next year, if, uh, if the council continues to uh, allocate funds for using ARPA, we have the uh, the construction for the 2023 annual re, uh, road rehab and, and storm drain repairs, and also uh, Moraga Road and Hacienda project. So the status of our ARPA funds um, for CIP projects, uh, recently the town council awarded a contract to current engineering for the Moraga and Hacienda drainage project. And tonight you'll be, uh, you're also tonight uh, awarded a contract for construction management for that same project earlier in the evening. Um, and this current item that you're considering is, is awarding an engineering design contract for the 2021 annual road rehab storm drain repairs project. And also we're working on the drainage uh, and sediment study I mentioned earlier. We're working on the engineering consultant RFP for that project and that'll come to the council soon also. We do have a number of other projects that are funded through our uh, storm drain impact fees. We have the town, town council just recently awarded a contract to see CSG consultants and engineering design agreement. And also the town's been working on the Lupita Creek restoration project phase two. Uh, we have an item probably to come to you at the next meeting um, to uh, provide support for a grant application. Uh, to the uh, Department of Water Resources for an additional $400,000. And we'll need a, a letter or a resolution of support for that project. But the good news about this project has been, we've been working diligently with Cal OES and FEMA uh, to uh, uh, um, strategize how the importance of this project and we've been able to increase the uh, cost to benefit ratio of the project almost to 2.0. And they, the minimal level for funding is 1.0. So we're confident after completing the 65% uh, design environmental work that FEMA will uh, hopefully be awarding us the uh, continuation of the design and going into construction. And we're waiting for that res um, response from FEMA as they analyze what we've done for them. So the item tonight that uh, we have before the council for consideration is a engineering design services for the 2021 street repairs. And what's really important about this project is, is the ARPA funding will allow us to, do, to go out and um, videotape and inspect up to 10,000 linear feet of, of storm drain pipe. And that, that includes the 766, uh, 7,660 7, uh, 7, linear feet of the corrugated metal pipes and, and also any nuisance pipes or pipes that are 36 inches or larger that we consider uh, critical that if there was a def uh, deficiency there that they, they would cause uh, significant uh, infrastructure damage. So uh, this is our most critical section with 10,000 linear feet of uh, pipes that we can inspect with this project. It would really take care of the problem areas that we're concerned about and really understand what the condition of those pipes are. Uh, so the, the design contract would 
I inspect these uh, pipes, upload that information to the town GIS, develop it and log a prioritized uh, uh, rating for the when pipes should be replaced based on the inspections, give them a rating system. Uh, we identify any kind of uh, priorities for relocation of utilities. Most importantly, we bring back a, a engineering design recommendations and cost estimate for each of the pipes that the town council in, in a form of a report, as an assessment report, can review and prioritize the program as, we, as we're moving forward and design and, and determine how much money we should be spending on pipes and what things could be de deferred in the future. Um, and then the consultant would also prepare a design bid package for the estimated $1.1 million worth of construction budget, which is currently forecasted in the uh, CIP. So the uh, staff's recommendation is to adopt a resolution awarding the contract, a professional contract to Harrison Associates. And that is the end of my formal presentation. I will stop sharing. Thank you, Sean. All right, council member questions. Mike. All right, thank you. Um, by the way, I thank you for that um, walk through history. That was uh, pretty helpful. That um, answered one of my questions. Um, so this is ARPA funding for storm drains. Um, and I just want to see if I have my understanding correct. So we had that really good detailed study in 2019, didn't identify everything with certainty, but it identified um, a lot of what we had. And our plan going forward, I believe, was high priority items followed by medium priority items and sort of spacing them out um, into future years. Now that we have ARPA, is it my understanding that we are taking advantage of ARPA, which when we did last year's budget, storm drain was part of the narrow definition and now the definition is broader. With ARPA, are we now advancing future work that we were gonna do anyway, but we were gonna do it perhaps in a future period into the next two years? Am I correct or if not, could you please correct me? <laughs> Maybe I can take a first step at that. If this, if yeah. that's okay, Sean, on a, on a high sure. level. So this is called your 2001 through 2023 program. And right. what that is, is that is three years worth of cleaning, televising, determining what needs to be done both reactively and proactively and putting it into a larger scale project where we can get economies of scale. So, right. so this is like a three year program and it's an incredible opportunity for the town to look at, as Sean indicated, that 10,000 linear feet of our most um, kind of, uh, vulnerable uh, pipe. So one of the things that we included in the report is that there'll be a conditions assessment report that we're scheduled to receive in August of 2022. And that report will say, okay, well, we looked at all these pipes and given your $1,186,000 construction budget, here's what you can do. And we'll design that, design projects for those and that those docs documents will receive back in January of 2023. But we may come to you because if there's some additional pipes mm -hmm. that really need to be repaired, it's an opportunity to uh, do a change order to our contract with Harris for the additional design work and add those, those pipes to the January project and have a bigger project and really get ahead of this. And that's just gonna put us in a much better position where we'll really be kind of leveraging that money to, to catch up. And we've done a lot of work so far. I mean, I think the city is really well poised to invest the ARPA funds in our storm drain infrastructure because of all the groundwork that's been done. Did I miss anything, Sean? Yeah, I think uh, the thing we should really make sure is clear on it is the, the original 2015 and 2019 studies were studies. 
and they were looking at the, uh, the infrastructure that's in place. They weren't going in there and videotaping and analyzing and determining what the uh, repair needs are. They were just, they were again, it's studied, determining where your pipes are, what size they are, where they're located, what the material is. And it identified, you know, our major need, of course, is, you know, and it quantified for us is the corrugated steel pipes because they've, you know, reached their lifetime many times over. And some of those are very critical that we get in there and inspect and repair. And so we, with the modest uh, investment that the council and did a few years ago, we got this program up and running. And we, and from that, we've developed a number of projects that we designed and we're now gonna go into construction as they've been awarded. And we have this rotation going in that we've got started with the modest and that this ARPA fund would allow us to go and inspect all the pipes that we have deemed very critical for inspection and make determinations if those need to be um, you know, repaired now, tomorrow, in 10 years or whatever. So we can make be confident about, you know, we're not gonna have that next sinkhole if we can prevent it by being proactive. Yeah, I don't know if I'm quite there, but I'll digest that um, and maybe come back one-on-one. -on -one. So the other question I had is, um, are we still comfortable, and you put it in your report, that uh, we need five, approximately $540,000 on average annually to fund capital and operating storm drain activities. So put our- I, I'll, I'll, take, I'll, I'll take a stab at this at first. And that is the information that we've gained from the one and a half years of programming that we've done has really been informative. And the information that we're gonna gain from going through all of this, that, as Sean indicated, the real life, you know, televising, cleaning, repairing is going to enable us to have better numbers um, that are based on our actual costs in the past. So I think that, I mean, I think that we'll be able to hone in on that. But everything is getting more expensive. So it's really hard because what it costs to, you know, do a particular pavement treatment to a street three years ago, when we were talking about, say, the worst first street program, those numbers are, have completely changed. So, I mean, I think that we're getting better information, but the world is changing. Hmm. What, what no do you have question. to say to that, Sean? And that's very much true that we we're seeing increases in construction price um, as we go along here. So it's not, it's not something that, uh, you know, we, we uh, had inspected, but, uh, you know, it's, it is the atmosphere that we have out here is the drastic increase in costs, you know, especially in the Bay Area. So uh, the longer you put it off, the more it's going to be, you know, that's, that's just the way of the world at this point. But addressing the corrugated metal pipes, they're the most vulnerable part of our system. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay, no more questions. Thank you, Mike. Steve. Thank you, Mayor. And, and I, I echo, I'm, I'm very concerned that um, the budget's gonna have to be managed. The work scope's gonna have to be managed because the, the environment that uh, you're gonna be operating in is, is gonna be very, very tight uh, and probably overheated. Um, just confirming, and, I, and you probably already stated this, but uh, what this inspection is focusing on is the 7,660 uh, feet of corrugated uh, metal or steel pipe. That's the first primary, uh, 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 you know, priority, of course. We will do all those pipes, um, but we do have a little bit of extra uh, literature that we can address anything that comes up as far as a nuisance, anything that's known as an issue, we can also in inspect that. So. Um, you, we are going to look at some of the larger pipes that are not uh, corrugated metal pipes, but that comes as a second priority. It allows us some flexibility to address issues. And this is just on the public public side, none of the public, uh, private, correct? All public pipes, yes. Okay. And um, Yeah, and basically, I just want to reiterate that the town does not take responsibility for the storm drain right. system that is on private property. That's, that is the property owner's responsibility. Right. Um, 
that poses some other questions, but not for tonight. Um, the I, I guess, and, and if Harrison Associates representative is still here, um, I kind of like to get their feedback on how they're going to be uh, equipped that as these inspections are done, if they spot uh, conditions, you know, will they be able to spot conditions that you need immediate attention? How are they going to know that? And uh, are they set up to to respond to that? And and you know some of the the, the reason I asked that is that you know in 2016, when that uh, eight foot corrugated steel pipe failed, um, you know it took out with it a, a gas pipeline, high pressure gas pipeline, and, and a, a light standard or you know, street lamp uh, light and uh, traffic light. And, and uh, you know, that's a really bad combination. And, and it, it could have been not just a disaster, but, but a, a tragedy. Uh, we're very lucky that it did not light off. Um, so I, I'm not sure that we're going to um, know for sure, you know, when something's gonna fail catastrophically, and you know maybe answers are steel plating on top or or a a active inspection program to monitor something that looks suspect. I I, I just like to get since they're the experts that are going to be doing the inspections. You know, can we get their their feedback and and also to get this out on the public in the public so that any public that are watching on live streaming they can hear uh, this about this because. As we know, some of these corrugated steel pipes are not in very good shape. I think that the only thing that I want to add before we turn it over to Harris and Associates is that, um, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Sean, but everybody knew that there was a problem with that large corrugated, corrugated metal pipe under Reem that, that failed. That was, that was a known issue, wasn't it, for the town? Because there had been some other issues in the area, so there were we knew that there was vulnerability there. So there's it's not like there's what we're addressing now is the remaining issues where there's vulnerability. Well, be, so. because that one failed, I think we can deduce that there are other ones that are in bad shape too. Right, <laughs> right. So so the question is, can we wait? You know, some period of time to to. Right repair them in, in logical fashion, or do we have to do some kind of a remediation type of program such as frequent inspections or? Okay, yeah. do, you, do you mind if I share the screen for a moment? Sure. Please go ahead. Thank you. I'll be quiet. So this, hopefully you see it, the screen of the NASCO rating system. It's a criteria, it's, a, it's very simplified. It's one to five. This is what our staff is trained. This is what is required of all inspectors to come into the town. They're using the industry standard. It's used both for storm drains and sewer systems. As you can imagine, it's, you know, this is a industry standard which is quite readily used. And it has this one to you know, zero to five rating system. And, um, you know, number five, if, if they put down a number five, it says it's going to fail or be failing very quickly. And so it needs immediate attention. So it's a red flag that we need to be doing something out there. So if any pipes that do the inspection process come back five, we will, we will adjust, you know, if they, uh, you know, if they monitoring or they repair or they, changing of you know that area to you know to protect it or protect the you know anything above it so there is these you know these kind of flags and depending on how the pipes rated that will give us an indication quickly of what we need to be doing so um, this has been put in place just for these these reasons and so I think you know we're, we have a system in place that it's going to tell us how we need to react when we need to react I'll stop sharing
So without being pedantic, I sent you a photograph yesterday of a pipe that has pretty extensive corrosion, uh, through corrosion, the, the pipe wall. Is that a four or five? Well, can you, can you say? Yeah, I, I, I personally haven't walked it, so I wouldn't want to say what that, that number is. Okay. Right. And that's, Fair enough. And, that, and that's where we have the, the system in place that we will go inspect it and rate it appropriately. But I will say that I've been in much worse pipes and, and that uh, have, or have failed or will fail than that pipe that uh, you showed me the picture of. And so uh, our staff has been monitoring to that pipe and we've been out there a number of times. So at, the, at this point, we we're comfortable with what's happening and we really like to get a contract in place and have it, it officially rated through the system to make sure we were doing the right approach. I agree. Any other questions, Steve? No, ma'am, thank you. Thanks Mike, before I revert to you, any, Teresa oh, or Sona, do you have any questions? Mike, you're, you, you yeah, get your second, you're up a second time in the Indian. Yeah. Yeah, sorry for um, not having the patience to wait. <laughs> yeah, so Sean, it's just what you just shared was triggering what I was trying to articulate from back in 19 and 20, which was I thought we had gone through that type of analysis, your grade zero to five, and obviously you're going to do five first, immediate need. But then as you had grade four there, five to 10 years, so you have a few years to spread those costs out. And then grade three was moderate and you have even more years to spread the costs out you know everything's a risk at the end of the day so what i was I, what i thought we were doing with arpa funds is like okay we had this plan but now that we have this arpa money and storm drains is one of our most important unfunded needs let's accelerate some of that work into the arpa time frame and let's get that done that I, I'm, I'm trying to say it a little clearer than I did the first time. And I'm just trying to say, is, is that conceptually correct? Or, or if, if not, please uh, help me understand. But there's uh, two things. Uh, if we can go back to our enhanced program, it's both a uh, proactive and reactive program. The uh, proactive part is we're gonna go in there and uh, inspect pipes and make determinations if they need to be repaired or not. The reactive part is the things that we've already seen that are failing. Uh, we, you know, we, we've gone out right. there and looked at them already. They're, they're listed, a number of those are listed in the, the addendum or the original uh, 2015 uh, 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 storm drain master plan that have showed that there's issues there, we should be addressing them. And so we, we have a, you know, the Enhance program has a list of CIP projects and it also has o and to go out and do an inspection. So it's a combined program. The ARPA funds will allow us to, you know, if we, if we choose to use ARPA funds, it will allow us to go after those most vulnerable pipes that need to be repaired now or the next number of years and make sure those do not fail um, you know, prior to that point. And so it's an opportunity to use those funds for the appropriate use of you know, getting ahead of your infrastructure needs and before you have those major failures. Um, so yes, uh, we, you know, it's, a, it's an opportunity and we're hoping that uh, the council you know, will believe in that and we have the program set up to implement it. Okay, and as your report says, the corrugated metal pipes, which I think we all understood were the risks, we were quite pleased to see in 2019, that's a very small percentage. 7% of our pipes are corrugated, as you state in the report. So that's yes. the high risk, only seven. So then the variability around 7% doesn't concern me as much because I've got a greater confidence and predictability in the other 93%. So I'm just trying to put it in perspective. So end of my questions, thank you. All right, any other council member questions? Um, if I may, I, I, I wanted to, to ask about um, the sentence at, on page four, the paragraph that says, it's likely that the inspections will reveal more failing pipes that need to be repaired or replaced than the 1.186 million construction budget for the project. Based on the conditions assessment report scheduled to be received in August 2022, the town could consider allocating additional ARPA funding to the project. 
And if I if I understood Cynthia, what you were saying correctly, um, so I guess we we have a choice, right? We could we could maybe put aside a little bit extra right now in anticipation of there being additional needs identified, or we wait until we actually have the hard data and have the analysis from Harris. And and it, it, am I correct that that the the latter approach is more prudent because then we we really know what we're dealing with here from a if there is a a shortfall in the budget. Yeah, I mean, I'm assuming that you that the council isn't going to decide that they're going to spend all 1.6 million dollars of kind of unallocated ARPA funds in this next year, so that you're going to set some aside. So that funding will be set aside, and then um, come August, we'll come back and we'll uh, let you know what the report is and potentially make a recommendation to uh, you know modify or amend the Harris contract for the design services so that we can and and increase our construction budget so that we can really take care of all of the pipes that score five and really need to be repaired. Okay, thank you. And uh, so Sean, it, 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 Elizabeth was here earlier. And is she gone for good or did she just blip out temporarily? Because I, I just want if, okay. if council members have questions of Harris, I don't want to close questions before um, I see if she's coming back or not. Yeah, I don't see her on the, on the screen here. Either. Okay, all right. And Madam um, Mayor, if I may, I just wanna be clear that the item before the council tonight is not a budget decision. It's just the Harris and Associates Award. Yes, is it, were we, were we straight? Well, we were having a lot of discussions about budget allocations and spending money on ARPA funds and how we're gonna line that up. And I wanna be clear that the item on the agenda tonight is just for Harris and Associates. Okay. Yeah, I thought, but I thought these were all issues raised by the staff report that the council members were asking questions about. So I thought I thought it was fair game. We, we but we've done great so far. I just wanted okay. to remind everybody what the item is. Okay, fair enough. All right. Uh, any more council member questions? Okay, public comment on this item. I don't see any raised hands, so I'll close public comment. Any council member comments? Teresa. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. And thank you, Sean, for all of your work. I, I just think this is so incredibly important. And that night, that rainy night that that pipe failed, um, I talked to the guy who was fixing the light. And he said that his son was the dispatcher for the gas company. And when that light was failing, he called his son and said, get somebody over here right now. And I mean, that's how close we were. And had it not been pouring rain, you know, we could have had, we could have lost lives. So I just want to tell everyone how important this is. And, you know, thank you, Sean, for everything that you do to keep us safe. You've got, I, I know you've got our back and I'm glad. <laughs> well, thank you for those kind words. Sona. I appreciate the diligence um, in particular, you know, explaining in detail how the analysis comes together and um, appreciated all the questions my fellow council members asked to kind of understand the, the full contours of what we're de uh, deciding today. But I'll just echo that I don't think we can, we can sit on this and um, would, would like to move forward. Thank you. Anyone else? Mike. Yeah, um, uh, once, once again, um, Sean, I would like to add, thank you actually for your work on this and uh, before you, Edric, um, because um, I, I do feel that we've got some very good information here. Um, using the ARPA funds on this agenda item um, just makes a lot of sense. I'm just having, I'm just trying to connect the bigger picture and what's changed um, and what hasn't changed. And I'm sure that'll become clear um, in the in the CIP. So um, no, I'm uh, I'm supportive. I think it makes sense. 
And as we go forward through the budget process, we can have other discussions. So thank you, Sean. And, uh, and Harris, who I believe has worked with the town multiple times, different division, but you know, quality, quality good partner. So um, you, you've got full support here. Thank you. All right, any other comments? Do you want me to move it? Uh, I, I had a couple of things I wanted to say, but Steve, do you have anything? I was gonna make a motion, but go ahead. Okay, go ahead. You don't need to hear me talk. Go ahead, please. No, no, but you, you said you were gonna. Yeah, I, I just, I, I wanna thank, thank Sean. I mean, and, and, and echo what others have said. I mean, to be proactive on this, I think is critically important. And, um, and, and as we, you know, I, I just feel better that we continue to refine our knowledge starting in 2015, then 2019, and this is putting a finer point on it. I also like in, in looking at the Harris sort of project plan and, and proposal, there are a lot of checkpoints here and a lot of, a lot of places where um, there is going to be reporting and accountability. And um, it, this just strikes me as a project that is, that is going to be done very rigorously with great transparency and opportunity for council uh, to, to understand what's happening. So, uh, so I'm, I'm fully in favor and I would invite a motion. Teresa, do you want to do it or? Fine. I, I, I Go ahead. move that we award a professional services agreement for engineering design services to Harrison Associates, Concord, California, in a total amount not to exceed $344,573, including 15% contingency of $44,944 for the two for the 2021-2023 Annual Road Rehabilitation and Storm Drain Repairs Project, CIP 21-205, and authorizing the town manager to execute the agreement, CEQA status categorically exempt. I second. All right, we have a motion from Vice Mayor Wolke, a second from Council Member Onoda. Any further discussion? All right, roll call vote, Council Member Macker? Yes. Council member Onoda. Was that a yes, Teresa? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Council member McClure? Yes. Vice Mayor Wolicki? Yes. Mayor Sauce, yes. The motion carries unanimously. Um, Sean, thank you. Excellent work as always. Thank you. Um, all right, uh, 11 discussion items. There are none. Uh, council requests for future agenda items. Do we have any? We have none. Okay, move on to communications. That's just noted for the record, right? That we received this letter. There's no discussion about this. Is that correct? That's correct. Thank you. Uh, and so um, then we are on item 14, adjournment. Teresa, my apologies. It's not 7.30, but it's not <laughs> nine yet. It's pretty good. Okay, I move that motion. we adjourn. What motion, do we okay. have a second? Okay, second, council member Macker. Um, roll call vote. Council Member Macker? Yes. Council Member Onoda? Yes. I'm not talking loud enough. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member McClure? Yes. Vice Mayor Wallachie? No, because we're not to 11 o'clock yet. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Steve, you keep going. Go ahead. Steve, have a nice time. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, that's the truth. Mayor Sosley, yes, all. the motion carries. Thank you. Yes, we thank you, everybody. Good thank meeting. You. And good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you to staff. Thanks, thank Denise. You. Good night, everyone. Good night.